Hey everybody, welcome and thank you so much for tuning in to the Wayward Outreach Sermon. We really believe this sermon is going to bless you, so stick around and watch. I'm so happy to be out here at the Wayward Outreach. Amen. It feels like home. Every time I come, it's like my second home. I'm, give it up for Pastor Marco Garcia, would you? Amen. And Pastor Roberts and Pastor Armando. Come on, praise God for all the leadership in this church. Amen. Amen. We're so excited that we're here this week. I, I, I heard that you guys were celebrating last week. I got my t-shirt on my way. 15th year anniversary last week. So, so I wasn't here last week, but I'm out here for the after party. Huh? How many came for the after party? We came to... How many know sometimes the after party is even better than the party? You know? <laughs> so we're so glad that to be in the house of the Lord on this morning. How many of you got your Bibles and you're ready to get in the Word of God? Listen, I got a word for you this morning I want to share with you. I shared with the earlier service. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6, beginning at verse 10. Yep. I want to say to all of our uh, campuses that are watching, in, in particular the downtown campus, how glad I am to be here uh, ministering to you this morning. I hope that you're tuning in. Hope that you're praying for me. Normally I come down here and visit you, but we got technology now. And I can just say praise the Lord to you and wave at you and say I'm glad that you're watching. Amen? Amen. Give it up for our downtown campus. Praise God. All right, Ephesians chapter 6. Now, I want you to also turn to Psalm 78, the 78th division of Psalms, uh, beginning at verse 9. And that's actually where we're going to be taking our thought. I just give it some context by reading the book of Ephesians. So turn to both of those scriptures, uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, beginning there. And then we're going to go to Psalm 78. If you ready, say amen. amen. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, you know the rest, stand therefore. All right, Psalm 78. The children of Ephraim, being armed and carrying bows, meaning that they had weaponry, um, they had the goods, being armed and carrying bows, but they turned back in the day of battle. For they did not keep the covenant of God, they refused to walk in his law. And here's what I want you to see. And they forgot his works and his wonders that he had shown them. Yeah, they turned back. They turned back in the day of battle. Uh, I want to use a simple subject this morning. Stand up to it. Just stand up to it. And in particular, I'm, I'm here to speak to a group of people or several individuals who may be standing in the face of adversity, extreme conditions, extreme frustrations, and, and you feel like at times you just want to collapse, that you want to give in and give up, that you want to throw up your hands and walk away. I have to qualify who I'm talking to because many people, when we talk about spiritual warfare, they think spiritual warfare is, is, is because somebody stole your parking spot at, at church. <laughs> and because you don't tell them off or cuss them out, they, they call that spiritual warfare. Or, or, or maybe you're used to sitting on a certain side of the building in a certain seat, and then when you got in, somebody took your favorite seat. So you want to go into spiritual warfare. That's pediatrics. That's, that's baby stuff. I'm, th there are some people in here that know we are in a real battle. And you may have been in a battle for a long time. And I, I just came to tell you by the word of the Lord, God said to tell you to stand up to it. Don't run. Don't turn your back. Don't give up. Don't give out. Look at somebody and say, stand up to it. Don't punk out. Don't leave. Don't walk away. Look at them again and say, stand up to it. Father, bless your word this morning as we go further. Be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. 
I, I, I was reading an article, an interesting article written by a pastor by the name of Daryl Crouch, and he entitled his article, uh, The Rise of the Fragile Christian, How Ease is Becoming a Way of Life. And in it, he describes how many Christians today are what he describes fragile, sensitive, almost weak in their faith, because somehow they have gotten confused and think that Christianity is about taking a seat on a couch and not realizing that God has called us to a battlefield. And I find that that attitude not just permeates within the, the subordinates or within the congregation, but it also uh, finds its way into ministry echelons as we find leaders who are more concerned with being popular than being effective. That we are often so distracted with having titles that we're not concerned about being powerful. And so because we are distracted with, with, the, with, with, with ease and with comfort, instead of being pulled to a battlefield, many times we're not prepared to deal with the real fight that is going on in the spirit. It, it, it has gotten so weird, it's gotten so strange that when we as Christians finally come into confrontation or issues or challenges, we think it's strange. We think something is wrong. First Peter said, think it not strange concerning the fiery trials that ought, to, that ought to try you, as if some strange thing has happened to you. In fact, Jesus told us and warned us that in the world you shall have tribulations. So many times when we get into trouble and conflict and issues, the devil makes us think that we are in conflict because we're in the wrong direction. But in fact, many times the conflict is a sign you're in the right direction. That the truth of the matter is that the enemy, when you was on his side, it was easier because you were going with the grain. You were going with the flow. You were going along with his plans. But the moment you made a 180 and decided to go against the grain and swim upstream, it seems as if the battle got hard and it's supposed to. This is a battleground. This is not the beach. And many times as Christians, now I'm not trying to be funny, but we're so distracted with trying to find the ease and the comfort of living with our Christianity that we've gotten weak in our faith and become ineffective in the kingdom. And we do not really, really flow in the power of God because though you have the equipment, though you have the anointing, though you have the power, you are not really using it for what it's used for. Many Christians, I believe, we're raising a generation of Christians who lack what I call spiritual coping skills. It, it, it's almost like what we do with our children at times. We're so easy trying to make life, we're so uh, 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 distracted with trying to make life easy for them that we rob them of the skills that are necessary for life and success. You follow what I'm saying? For example, and I believe in blessing your kids. I believe in giving them the very best. But sometimes we give them too much and we rob them of the ability to develop hard working ethic. They're used to having everything handed to them. And when you raise children who are spoiled and have everything handed to them and they don't have to earn it, then they go out in the world and think that the world owes them something. We, 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 we don't teach them to have negotiation skills and the ability to compromise. So when they go into marriage, for example, they think it's my way or the highway. And they haven't developed the ability to negotiate and work through problems and issues. And so whenever they run into a problem, they're ready to quit or throw up their hands or walk out because they have not developed the ability to work through issues. And even though you might disagree, you don't have to become disagreeable. We're so busy trying to save them from struggle that by the time they get in the real world, they have not developed the ability to stand up to stuff and have something tough in them that can handle adversity. So every time they run into something, they want to run home because they have not developed the ability to stand up to something and be a man. Put on your big boy pants and stand up to it. We're spiritually weak and we're not prepared to deal with the real issues of life and to really change this world because we're busy trying to be comfortable rather than be effective. And God as a father is more concerned about your development than he is with your comfort. 
God says, I've made more of an investment in you than to have you walk around being important and not be powerful. And so sometimes God takes you through things to develop your spiritual muscles. You think God is trying to kill you, but God is trying to develop you because he knows what's ahead of you. He knows there's a problem around the corner, and if I don't get you ready now, you're not going to be able to stand up to it. Look at somebody say, stand up to it. It's almost like, it's like a caterpillar who's, who's trying to emerge from a cocoon. He, he, he bites a small hole in the bottom of the cocoon. And out of that small hole, he begins to squeeze himself and pull himself. It's a tight spot. It's an aching place. It's difficult. And you would think that he's in trouble and you want to help him. But in actuality, him squeezing through that tight space is allowing his wings to be stretched. So that when he emerges from his cocoon, he is not just a butterfly, he is not just a caterpillar, but now he's a beautiful butterfly with strong wings that can carry him into the air. And some of you, God said to tell you, he's taking you through a tight place. I know you don't want to hear this. You want it to be an easy place. But God said, if I kept making it easy for you, you're not going to be effective. So I made it hard sometimes. I made you have to pray sometimes. I made you have to get in a tight place sometimes. I made things difficult for you because I was trying to develop you into something that would give me glory. Oh, maybe that's where it is. Maybe the problem is you're trying to get glory instead of God getting the glory. Maybe, maybe that's the real issue. Maybe you're trying to be grand and important and God is trying to make you powerful and effective. I think we do God's people a disservice when we don't prepare them for battle. If you look at Ephesians chapter 6 and we just read it, you would see a picture of conflict and weaponry and strategy. And then he concludes at the end of that, put on the whole armor of God. I don't see no bikinis in that picture. <laughs> no sandals, no sand, no beach, no pina colada, oops, I mean, you know, <laughs> lemonade. <laughs> None of that. The picture that you get from Ephesians, Ephesians 6 is of a soldier. He's dressed, he's prepared for battle. He's coming in there with the helmet of salvation and he comes in the room with his shield of faith and a breastplate of righteousness. He has a sword in his hand, uh, which is the word of God. He's prepared to do damage on the kingdom of the enemy. Where are my devil chasers at in here? Where are my people here that are ready to do damage on the kingdom of the enemy? Make some noise. Identify yourself. I came to get something done. I came to chase demons. I came to make that devil let my family go, let my community go, let my church go. I didn't come to patty cake no devils. I'm a devil chasing, demon chasing. Nobody gets all dressed for war if there's gonna be no enemy. Why would God give us all this if he knew there was gonna be no enemy? He was telling you the very fact that he gave you spiritual armor was a sign that there was gonna be a struggle. I know you're shocked, I know you're mad, and I have to apologize to all the people who sold you on the idea that being a Christian meant that you was gonna have everybody love you. <laughs> And everybody was going to like you and everybody was going to get along with you and, and there was going to be Kool-Aid coming out the water fountain. And, <laughs> and I apologize for everybody who sold you on the idea that becoming a Christian meant that everybody was going to get along with you. But I come to tell somebody in this room that God didn't call you to a couch. He called you to a cross. And how dare you think that your savior is going to go all the way to the cross and suffer and die and you being a follower and you're not going to suffer too. Paul said that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. I've been called to this. Be called to make a difference. But look at somebody and say stand up to it. 
It's going to be tough. It's going to be rough sometimes, but stand up to it. You're going to have issues and problems and challenges, but I'm telling you that God has equipped you to go through this. He's put something down in you. For every trial you came over, he developed you so that you could take the next time. That for everything you survived, God was simply getting you ready for the next battle. How many can look back over your life and see the things that God brought you over? And say, I, 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 I'm not what I used to. Oh, I, I may not be what I should be, but, but God, I'm not what I used to be. How many can thank God for the fact that you're not who you you? You didn't pray like you did before. You didn't pray like that. Let me tell you something, my praise is real. When you hear me praise God, trust me, this is 30 years of surviving issues and problems and challenges, and I'm still here. So when I praise God, this ain't no baby novice praise. I earned this. I earned the right to give God the praise. You, so now, Tet's Ephraim was all dressed up. Psalm 78, all dressed up, had bows, had weaponry, had strategy. They marching down to the battlefield, ready to do damage on the kingdom. And as soon as they ran into a real problem, they ran back. Ain't that funny? Ain't that a funny image? Coming down to the battlefield, what they call, the young people say, fronting. Yeah, you fronting. You ain't really gonna do nothing. You, you just talking, you just fronting, you just, you just flexing, you just, you just making noise, you talking loud and you ain't saying nothing. And let me tell you something, we got some demons out here, they know when you're fronting. Yeah, 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 yeah. They, they know when you're putting on, they know when you're faking. There is a difference when a real anointing walks in the room. Oh, you can have talent, but I'd rather have anointing than just have talent. When you sing and got an anointing, you may not be able to sing great, but you can sing with power. You. And God is trying to move us away from being people who put on fronts and don't have no power. Gone are the days that we can just hang a cross around our neck and think demons will run because you got a cross on your neck or a cross on your bumper sticker. Demons don't care nothing about what you wear on your neck. They'll come in and sit right next to you in church. We need some folks who got power. Slap somebody and say we need power up in here. We need power. We need power. So Ephraim, incidentally, Ephraim's name means fruitful. And some of you Bible scholars will remember that Ephraim was the second son of Joseph. After he came out of the prison, out of Potiphar's prison, and he was raised to a place of prominence, he had two sons, and his first son was named Manasseh, which means that God has caused me to forget. God gave him two sons. One was named Manasseh. The first meant God has called me to forget. Because there is a place that God will bless you so good that you'll forget what you went through. Yeah. Yeah. God will cause me to forget all the trouble that I went through. Some of you can't enjoy your today because you're still crying about yesterday. You can't enjoy who loves you now because you're still crying over who left you then. But there is a God that'll bless you so good that'll make you forget. I, I don't even remember. I, some of you are carrying bitterness and anger from stuff that happened 15 years ago. And God said, you have to shake that off. God said, I'm going to give you a child. I'm going to give you a gift of forgetfulness. My God. Some of you, God's going to bless you so good, you're not going to remember that fool's name that broke your heart. What, what, what's his name? What's her name? I can't. I Slap somebody and say, I forgot their name. I don't even know what happened. All I know, I know what I learned from it, but I don't even remember their name. How many folks know that you're glad that you learned something from it, but I'm still not hung up in it? And I know I'm free when I can think about it and I'm still not crying. I know I'm free when I can see him walking down the street and I can still have... I got to go. Hold on. <laughs> But in the day of battle, Ephraim ran back. 
had all the skills and the talent and ran back. Fruitful is what he was. Here's the problem. God is saying, how can you? I'm frustrated because I blessed you so much. I blessed you with weaponry and strategy and Ephraim's name meaning fruitful. I've given you favor. Fruitful meaning I've ble blessed you to prosper in the land of your affliction. That's what Ephraim's name means. Manasseh means he caused me to forget. But Ephraim means he caused me to be fruitful right in the land of my affliction. God said, I will give you a table in the midst of your enemies. I'll make you prosper right in the midst of your haters. I don't need to move you to a different city, a different town, a different church, a different job. I'll bless you right while they're trying to kill you. You don't hear me up in here. So God says, with that kind of favor and that kind of weaponry, Ephraim, my frustration with you is that how can you have so much and accomplish so little? That's the frustration. This whole Psalm 78 is just God rehearsing over and over and over all the things that God has done in the lives of his people. And the frustration that the writer has is how is it that God can bless you so much and you accomplish so little? Because when it came down to it, they didn't develop the spiritual skills to stand up against a real enemy. So how do you get ready for the day of battle? I found this out, I found this about Christians, that as long as the day lasts for like 24 hours, like a 24 hour cold, we're good. <laughs> if my financial struggle lasts for like 24 hours, I'm good. <laughs> if this marital crisis lasts for like 24 hours, I'm good. If these kids act crazy for like a day or so, I'm good. But the question becomes, how do you handle it when the battle lasts a long time? And many of us are not prepared to deal with the battle that lasts more than a day. But some of us in here have learned that we've had to be strong in the Lord for things that have, long, that have gone on for a long time. See, see, anybody can praise God for a problem that's over in 12 hours, 24 hours. But what we need are some people who can stand there for a long time and say, if he don't change it, if it don't change, see, we, we've got weak Christians now who if God don't give me a job in a day or two, we ready to quit church. I'm a tithe for a week. If it don't work, I'm gonna quit tithing. <laughs> Uh, uh, I'm going to try this marriage thing for two months and if it don't work, I'm going to get out. Uh, I'm going to work with this child for six weeks and if he don't straighten up in six weeks, I'm done. But we need some people who say, God, I'm going to stand here and believe you if i got to stand here for six months, six years, six days. In fact, I'm so crazy and radical, I'm going to give you a praise anyway. Where my radical saints at? They say, I'm going to praise God anyway. I'm... We, I know we don't do it much here, sis, but, but it used to be back in the day, we would give God an anyhow praise. <laughs> Anybody know what an anyhow praise is? Talk to me. An anyhow praise is that if it don't change, I'm going to praise God. Somebody has got an anyhow praise for God. My money might be funny. The warfare may be raging on. I may have to deal with issues for a long time, but I am determined I will bless the Lord at all times and his praise can continually be in my mouth with the radical people that don't care. I'm gonna praise him anyhow. So, so let me get you ready for battle. One, you can't forget what God has done. I'm listening to a friend of mine who, uh, was going on about some issues that they were going through. I mean, just going on and on and on and on about what they're going through. The money's funny, and this is happening, my child's acting crazy, and da 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 da, da. I listened to him for about 15 minutes. Then I said, you know what? Let me stop you. I've heard this before. Yeah. You've been through this before. You, you, you've been down this road before. You've had these issues before. You've had these kind of challenges before. And the same God that brought you then is going to bring you now. The same God that brought you through that last crisis 
is going to bring you through this crisis. So there's no need in you having a fit and falling out in the floor because the same God that brought you then, every once in a while you got to pull out your spiritual resume and tell that devil, look, the same God that brought me through that, I remember being homeless and he brought me. I remember being divorced and I made it. I remember losing my job and he fed me. I remember being in the hospital and he brought me out. Is there anybody that's got a testimony in here? Stop surrounding yourself with people who always remind you of where you were weak or failed or fell apart. And start surrounding yourself with people who remind you of your successes, of the things you did right and the things you did well and the things you came over. The Bible, the Bible says this in, in, in Revelation chapter 12. The devil is, is, is described as being an accuser of the brethren. And they said the accuser of the brethren has fallen down. That the devil, all he does is sit there and accuse you and point at you and constantly bring up to you why you can't make it, why you can't do it, why you don't deserve it, why you can't get over it. Every time you get ready to do something great, he reminds you of the failures and issues of your past and so when he starts reminding you of your problems and your past, it cripples you and it causes you to be paralyzed because you feel like, well, maybe I'm going to fail again. Interestingly, this little phrase there almost reminds you of somebody being pulled into court with charges against him. And there you walk in with your soiled clothing. I, don't, I, I, I can't speak for everybody in here. But, 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 for, but for me personally, my own personal testimony is sometimes what people said about me, it was true. <laughs> Can I get a witness in here? Everything they said about me wasn't a lie. Some of that stuff was true. <laughs> All of us in here got a pass. And if the devil were to take you into court based on your past, none of us would be able to get away scot-free because everybody in here got something that God had to bring them out of. So the enemy constantly takes you into the court of heaven and points at you and says, she don't deserve to be blessed. He don't deserve to be blessed. He don't deserve to come out of it. He don't deserve to get up. But the Bible said that they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. And by the word of their testimony, what that basically means is they called me into the court and they had the charges railed against me. And sometimes they had me red handed. I was caught red handed. They called me in as a murderer. They called me in as an adulterer. They called me in as a liar. They called me in as a drug dealer. And they had me dead to rights. And they should have killed me. But the blood. Just when he's about to throw the book at me, Jesus walks in with his blood and he pays the price for the sins that I committed. I'm trying to tell somebody that I beat the case. Oh, you don't hear me up in here. I said I beat the case. It's not that I was so right, it was just that his blood was so powerful. There was no sin that was more powerful than his blood. There was no problem that his blood couldn't cover. When I stand before God, I don't stand before God with my own righteousness. I stand there with the righteousness that is gained through Jesus Christ's blood. That when God got ready to judge sin, that Jesus put his blood over me and he didn't see my sin. All he saw was the blood of Jesus. Somebody thank God for the blood. Sometimes you got to talk back to that devil and say, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. The blood has made me righteous. No, I don't deserve to be blessed, but the blood made me deserve it. The blood made me worthy. Is anybody glad for the blood that made you worthy? Today? Second thing, don't lose focus on who God is in your life. It's easy to be distracted with the magnitude of your problems. It's easy to talk about how big the problems are. But you have to remain focused on big your God is. The enemy wants you to only see the problems. And God is trying to get you to focus on the solution. So you can't get so focused on the problem that you lose sight of the solution. Oh, my Lord. 
Here's what happened to the Israelites going in to the promised land. Twelve of them went over there. Twelve men went over there to see the promised land, and they saw the grapes, and they saw how the land was fruitful, and they saw how the land was prosperous, but they also saw them giants. How many know that problems come with problem, problems sometimes? That sometimes problems come with promise. That sometimes when God makes a promise, there's a problem wrapped up in it. Don't be so distracted with the problem that you miss the promise. So what happened was they went over, 10 guys went over there and came back and said, oh my God, there's giants over there. There's problems over there. Oh my God, we can't take them. The, the land swallows up people is what they said. Everybody that tried this couldn't make it. Everybody that attempted this failed. And sometimes people will project their fears on you. Don't do that because we tried it and we didn't make it. You can't let people project their fears on you. Sometimes because they were afraid and didn't succeed, they'll try to put their fear on you so that you won't try and succeed. It. They said, oh, we're afraid. Here was a phrase that, that they said that killed me. They said, they said we, we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. Because we saw ourselves as insignificant, our enemies saw us as insignificant. Because we saw ourselves as nobodies, they saw us as nobodies. What am I saying? I'm saying that God is telling you that some of the things that you're running from should be running from you. You are cowering in the face of things that should be cowering in front of you. You are running away from things that should be running away from you. That devil is not as powerful as you think he is. <laughs> I was getting to mess with somebody's mind today. I come to tell you that that problem is not as big as you think he is. That devil is not as tough as you think he is. He's not as bad as you think he is. He only whoops at you because you believe that nonsense. But if you turned your face away from him and started looking at your God and said, this ain't nothing but lunch for me. I eat problems for lunch. This is bread for me. Oh my God. See, we need some radical Christians, bro, because some people only want easy stuff. They want pudding and cake and ice cream and then wonder why they're spiritually weak. But we need some people that say, give me my lunch. Get, get, I'm a problem solver. I'm a devil chaser. Give me my lunch. When I go out here and fight devils, I'm just getting my meal together. I'm getting my happy sack, my happy meal. I'm... How many got problems in here right now? Raise your hand. God said, I just served you dinner. I just put it in front of you because I knew you could handle it. I put it in front of you because I wanted to give you something to chew on. I wanted to give you something to pray about. I wanted to give you something to make you seek my face. I wanted to give you something to make you get in the word. I wanted to give you something to make you pull out your spirituals. Look at somebody say, you ain't seen nothing yet. This problem is nothing but an opportunity to show how tough you are. I didn't know you could pray like that, so God said I created a problem so I could show the devil just how bad you are. Woo! You ain't seen nothing yet. Oh my God, when he gave me this problem, he gave me a blank canvas so I could show you just how powerful I am. You don't know me. Some of y'all that's been undercover and secret squirrel and hiding in the corner and hiding in the cut trying to act like you don't want to make no difference God said I'm going to create a situation where you're coming out of hiding and showing who you really are will the real Christians please stand up will the real praisers please stand up will the real Holy Ghost filled people identify yourself I'm here I'm in the house last thing last thing don't give in to your fear of the enemy. Most people think that courage is the absence of fear. But in reality, courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is having fear, but doing it anyhow. Anybody who's ever done anything worth talking about was afraid. They went scared. 
They went nervous. They went knees knocking. They went unsure. They went not knowing how it was going to turn out. They went not knowing if there was a guarantee. All they had was a word from God. Is there anybody in here that's got a word from God? I got no resources. I got no support. I got no friends. I got no company. Everybody saying something against it, but I heard a word from God. If there's anybody in here that's heard a word from God, give God a praise. I heard a word. I heard a word. A word from God will make you look crazy. A word from God will make people walk away from you. A word from God will make people think you done lost your mind. But I need some people who lost their mind, but they've got the mind of Christ. It don't make sense to you, but God told me to do it. You don't agree with it, but God said I'm going to be successful. God told Joshua, he said, listen, listen, be strong and of good courage. Be strong, Joshua. You're about to go into a land that got giants and they got enemies and you're going to have issues and you're going to have problems, but be strong. Why would he tell you to be something if you already were? He told him to be strong because there's something in us that when we face problems, the tendency will be to back up. But God said, I'm putting something down in you that when you see a problem, you step up. What we need more in church are people who are problem solvers. That when they see issues, they step up. Not complainers. We got plenty of complainers, but they don't do this right. And they don't do that right. And they don't handle that good. And they don't shut up. You need to get involved in the fight. It's like people that don't vote. If you don't vote, shut up. Don't say nothing. If you ain't going to get in the process, you ain't got no voice. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's impolite to say shut up, ain't it? I apologize. That was my mama coming out. Because whenever I start talking stupid, my mom says, shut up, boy, and do what I tell you to do. <laughs> she says, stop all that foolishness. Mama, I'm scared. Hush. You can do more than you think you can. You're better than you think you are. Mama, I can't figure this math problem out. Sit down and work on this problem till you get it worked out because I know you're smarter than that. And God is telling somebody in here, you got more in you than you think you do. Your enemies know it. The devil knows it. You just need to know you got more in you than you think you do. And I came this morning to call it out of you. Pull on somebody say, pull it out of you. I've come to pull on every gift, on every talent. I came to tell you to wipe your tears. You're tougher than that. You're not going to collapse under this pressure. You're not going to run away. God has put some fight down in you. High five about three people say, God put a fight down in me. He put a fight down in me. That's why I didn't give up, because he put a fight down in me. I might have cried, but I'm not giving up. I might have got tired, but I'm not giving up. By the time I wipe my ears, my tears from my eyes, I'm going to come right back at you, devil, because I'm stronger than that. I'm better than that. i got more grit than that. I've had more warmth. That's Armando, I can say that, because I've had some battles. I've had some fights. I've earned some battle scars. See, the problem with us is you want position, but you don't want to go through nothing. You got to earn this, baby. This anointing that you had was earned in the fire of affliction. You didn't walk up and get this because you was cute. Now, baby, I cry. I'm... I mean, let me close with this. When I was coming up in church, a young man just came up the streets. I wasn't even steeped in church and I didn't know anything about preachers and preacher talk and preacher jargon and stuff that people do you know in church that church folk know church colloquialisms things they say that church folk know folk know what it means but when you're from the street you don't know what it means so I walk into a church and uh, every once in a while the preacher would be preaching and and Alexa he would he right in the middle of the message he would jump back and say I feel my help coming And I'm looking around like, okay, 
He up there by himself, but he talking about, I feel my help coming. And, and I didn't know what it meant until I started working in the church. I didn't know what it meant until I started serving. That there is a place that you can get to in the spirit. That you step out of the natural into the supernatural. That you step out of fear into faith. That at first you can be attempting something and it's hard and it's difficult and you're ready to quit and you're tired and something will kick in. Is there anybody know the life for something to kick in? Right when you're about to collapse and fall to your knees, something will start picking you up and say, oh no, oh no devil. I feel my faith being stirred. I feel my power coming to me. I feel my help. Slap somebody and say, I feel my help coming now. I feel my help coming for these kids. I feel my help coming for this marriage. I was about to walk out, but I feel something down in I feel a fight down. Is there anybody that feels a fight down on it? I come to tell somebody that God said I'm about to help you. That help is on the way. That just when you thought the devil had you, I'm going to swoop in and rescue you. That just when you thought they was going to kill you, I'm going to step up and do something in you. They're going to wonder how you left crying, but you came back dancing. Because I put something... For somebody, the devil said, for all the stuff you're going through, ain't no way in the world you're going to get to church and praise the Lord. They made a bet in the heavenlies. I whipped her. I talked about her. I messed with her money. I dealt with her kids. Her marriage is on the rocks. They about to fire her. Ain't no way in the world she gonna get to church and give God a praise. And I almost agreed with him. I came in the house with my head bowed down, but somewhere in the middle of the service, I don't even know when it happened. It might have happened during the worship. It might have happened during the preaching, but I felt something on the inside. Something down on the inside begin to stand up and say, oh no. Somebody's got to praise for God and you've got to let it out. Let it out right here if you feel something. I feel something. I feel something. See, somebody sitting around you saying, it don't take all that. Y'all just got, y'all just excited. Y'all just don't know how to act. It's just a cultural thing. So, so, so tell you what, shake somebody by the hand and tell them, neighbor, I don't know about you, but I feel something on the inside standing up in me, saying I'm gonna make it. I'm gonna take it. Give God praise if you're gonna make it. Clap your hands and give him glory. Listen, listen, in the few minutes I have, there's some people in here that God has sent me here specifically to minister to. That you're in here, you're on the verge of collapse. That sometimes the weight of what you're going through feels as if it's gonna crush you. If you're in here right now and you feel like you're gonna be crushed under the weight of your issues and problems, I want you to come to this altar right now. God said, if you get up here, I'm gonna give you strength. You're gonna stand up to this. You're stronger than that. You're better than that. This is not gonna kill you. This is not, the devil is counting on it. The devil said that she's gonna give up any day now. He's gonna give up any day now. He's gonna walk away any day now, but I feel the strength of the Holy Ghost coming in this room. This is not gymnastics. This is not excitement. This is the Holy Ghost. I feel my help. I feel my help. Somebody shout help. Somebody shout help. Somebody shout help. Here it comes, lift your hands. Lift your hands right now, lift your hands. When we lift our hands, we're saying, God, I want your help. I surrender. I throw my hands up. I put my hands up like antenna because there's something in the atmosphere. There's something in the frequency that I need to touch. All around this altar, God, touch. All around this altar for that woman that's about to give up, touch. 
for that man that's about to quit, touch. For that person that's about to backslide, touch. For that person that said that God is not real and it doesn't mean anything, I want you to touch right now. In the name of Jesus, somebody begin to pray in here. Point your hands this way. The Holy Ghost is moving all over this altar, touch. Devil, this is not gonna take me out. This is not gonna take me out. I am not gonna collapse under this. My God is gonna stand up for me. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Ministers, go through and begin to lay hands on these. Just lay hands on them. Lay hands on them. Be strong in the Lord. 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 I command you. I command you. I command you. I call greatness out of you. You're stronger than you think you are. You got more in you than you think you do. Good God Almighty, deliverance is happening all around the altar. Somebody begin to put your hands this way and begin to give God glory for what he's doing. Thank you so much for tuning in to today's message. Now join me for a word of prayer. God, thank you so much for today's word. We pray that it would touch our heart and we would learn how to apply it this week. Continue to go with us this week and encourage us, strengthen us, and help us to walk with you. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much again. And, and if you'd like to partner with us by supporting the ministry, simply click the link in the bio or the description. Thanks again.